So it's uh, a pleasure for me to pass the baton to uh, Joshua Bengio. Uh, you heard me uh, make one brief uh, mention of uh, the Avado program in um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, Joshua is one of the, uh, the, three, the triumvirate of leaders who, who relaunched uh, deep learning that was quite popular as a, a neural network idea in the 80s and 90s, and, and Joshua. Uh, Jan LeCun and Jeff Hinton uh, relaunched it in the, in the uh, 2000s, and uh, it's become basically a monster which is taking over everything that we do. So <laughs> we're going to hear more about the applications of, of uh, deep learning, specifically in the context of uh, neuroscience. So Joshua is going to talk to us. Uh, Joshua is from the University of Montreal, I should have said. Uh, Joshua is going to talk to us about bridging the gaps between brains, cognition, cognition and deep learning. Joshua. Thank you. Right, actually, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you much about applications of deep learning, um, but more about the connections between deep learning and neuroscience and cognition, at least some of them. They only have half an hour. Um, just to get um, off the ground about deep learning is, is an endeavor that's part of research in AI and machine learning. Um, the central goal of AI is to put knowledge into computers, um, but uh, what has prevented uh, you know, that from happening much earlier is that a lot of the knowledge we have that we would like computers to have um, isn't knowledge that we can communicate directly because it's, it's not consciously accessible. Um, and so computers have to learn from, from data in order to succeed, and, and, and deep learning has been an approach to learning uh, uh, for computers that has been immensely successful, um, mostly in the area of perception, but, but to some extent also in, in uh, uh, everything that have, having to do with language, uh, like machine translation, uh, playing games, uh, driving cars, um, translating, like in this example, from images to texts, all kinds of things. Um, let me uh, step back a little bit uh, about how the, I think one really important thread in neural network research started in the 80s uh, called connectionism. Um, so, so connectionism, I, I've tried to summarize it in one sentence. It's a pretty, it's a pretty long sentence. It should be broken down into pieces. So what, what it's about, and it's also something, of course, that is still at the heart of what deep learning is today, um, iteratively training um, distributed representations so this, this notion of distributed representation is the idea that we, we represent information through uh, a pattern of activation, which of course is natural for, for the brain, through a composition of neurally inspired simple operations. And then that part is really important towards a justifiable training objective. So there's, there's this notion that uh, the learner is optimizing something um, that's well defined and makes sense. Um, so that training objective forces the learner to capture the relevant statistical structure of the data. Um, so I have another talk, which I'm not going to give, which goes through uh, a list of what I found uh, to be um, ideas from neuroscience and cognition that have influenced machine learning and especially deep learning um, over the years. So, of course, uh, neurons, networks, plasticity and learning, discrete representations that I mentioned. Um, a lot about the architecture of uh, neural nets, is, and especially these convolutional nets, is inspired by the visual cortex. The idea of depth, in other words, to have multiple levels of representation, also is inspired by what we know about the cortex. Um, the kind of nonlinearities inspired by the brain, in particular the uh, rectified linear units, which are now used. In the, in, in the last five, six years uh, have dominated the field, uh, were inspired by neuroscience. Um, spikes, well, it, it looks like we don't use spikes in deep learning, but actually um, there are different things like dropout, where you inject binary noise into the system, and, and also uh, systems that are quantifying uh, activations of neural nets that, that are being developed, which have some resemblance to spikes. Um, curriculum learning is something that's more on the cognitive side about um, um, training from uh, not independent examples, but, but uh, through a sequence of examples that are gradually more difficult and, and, and sort of like a teacher would do with a child. Uh, cultural evolution and distributed training, how multiple agents can learn together and help each other. 
uh, notions from psychology of uh, affordances, options in reinforcement learning, um, uh, notions of exploration, uh, this is all in, in reinforcement learning, and notions of controllable factors, so the, the relationship between representations and uh, what an agent can do in, in, in the world, what it can control. The notion of attention, which has really become uh, a central tool in deep learning in the last few years. Um, the notions of lateral connections, which come up in uh, what's called softmax and clustering and notions of attractors. Uh, notions of associative memories, which I probably will mention at the end. Uh, so there's more and more research in connecting uh, not just a standard uh, neural net, which you can think of as like cortex, but also um, uh, things that act more like memory to these neural nets. And, um, and then, of course, uh, notions that connect to classical AI, uh, sort of system two types of computation that involve reasoning, planning, and consciousness. All of these things are happening in deep learning and, of course, have tied to brain sciences. So there is an underlying assumption behind a lot of um, those connections and, and also uh, that motiv has motivated me for uh, the last few decades, which is that um, there would be a few simple principles that explain both human intelligence and animal intelligence and that we could use to build intelligent machines, right? So, and, and it's not clear that, of course, this hypothesis is true. Maybe the brain is just a huge bag of tricks. Uh, and so it, it is a hypothesis. But it, if it's true, then uh, the consequences, both for our ability to understand the brain uh, and the big picture of the brain, uh, as well as to build intelligent machines, uh, it, it could be immense. Um, let me let me skip these things um, and uh, go back to the connection between brains and deep learning. Um, so I feel like if we're trying to understand the brain, uh, of course there are many aspects to it, but um, one aspect which really would explain a lot about the brain is how it learns, because you could, you could imagine that the learning mechanisms themselves are fairly simple in the sense that it could be described by maybe a few equations. Uh, but the consequences of these learning um, um, mechanisms uh, could be huge in terms of the function that, that the, the brain could do. And so uh, when you think in this way, you start thinking about um, not what particular neurons are doing, but um, of course how they learn, uh, what it is that th this learning is optimizing, if it is optimizing something, what kind, what kind of architecture, structure in, in, the, in, the, in the circuits um, makes it easier or, or uh, more difficult to learn different kinds of things, um, and, and so on. So these kinds of high-level explanations are the kinds of um, um, questions that deep learning researchers are thinking about, and I think that um, it could be useful for neuroscience to uh, start thinking with these, these views. Um, if you uh, consider the two extremes of uh, low-level computation that is typically what's uh, studied by, by neuroscientists on one hand, and, and the other hand, um, higher-level questions about computation in the brain, that uh, uh, cognitive uh, scientists are studying. What's interesting with uh, neural network research is that it can span both of these levels, right? So, um, and, uh, and as I said, there's inspiration um, coming from both of those sides. And of course, that could go the other way as well. Now, I'm gonna now focus on uh, uh, some work that we've been doing that's on the side of uh, the, the, the brain implementation of uh, neural networks, and, and particularly uh, the question of um, is the brain doing something similar to backprop? So backprop is the workhorse of the success of deep learning, and what it is is just a mechanism to do credit assignment for a large network of neurons interconnected in complicated ways, in arbitrary ways, to figure out how each of them can change a little bit so that some overall objective is, is uh, improved gradually. Um, and uh, for many decades, the, the dominant thinking was, well, there's no way that the brain could do something like backprop for all kinds of reasons. Um, and now, in the last few years, we see a flurry of papers that suggest uh, implementations 
in the brain that uh, at least are much more plausible than would have been thought possible uh, to estimate gradients in a style that's similar to backprop but not be exactly the same. So um, um, one question with backprop is, uh, you know, if we want to implement something like backprop in the brain is, how are we going to encode the error signals that are normally propagated in, in these uh, deep artificial networks? And uh, one major obstacle to uh, coming up with a biologically plausible um, uh, analog to backprop is um, that we would like the computation uh, performed to uh, compute those gradients, to backpackage those gradients, to also be done by neurons, right? We, we, we don't want like a separate kind of computation um, that is not biologically plausible for the, the, uh, the backprop or for the um, estimation of the gradient. Um, so there's a hypothesis which has been proposed already in the late 80s, which um, our work is, is writing on, and um, about how these error gradients could be represented in the brain. And the hypothesis is that the error gradients are represented by temporal derivatives of activations. So one way to think about it is um, uh, the level of firing rates of neurons uh, encodes um, the you know, computation that is being performed. Um, but then those neurons receive feedback from potentially various sources that steer them towards slightly better configurations. And so there's, there's going to be a change in the activity, and that small change would be encoding um, error gradients. And um, so we don't know that's true, of course, um, but this is, this is an interesting hypothesis to explore, both in theory and, and eventually, as, as we're starting to do, through experiments on animals. So now I'm going to tell you about a particular algorithm that exploits this hypothesis, which we introduced um, last year, called equilibrium propagation. And um, it's analogous to uh, backpropagation through two phases of computation, which I think we can eventually merge into one. But, but for now, think of that as two phases, uh, similar to what I mentioned before. So there's uh, a forward phase in backpropagation in which the network uh, takes inputs and produces predictions or something, or um, um, ex you know, expected rewards, or whatever it is that we care about. Um, and in a propagation, this is going to be implemented by uh, a relaxation phase, a free phase, where the, the network, which now has dynamics and you know feedback connections and feedforward connections and natural connections, is um, is is being influenced by the input and 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 converging dynamically to some configuration. So this is the um, equivalent of the forward pass. And then there's going to be a um, Backward pass, and this is this is the place where uh, it's not obvious how you know brains could implement the equivalent of the uh, of the backward pass that we find in backpropagation. Um, so the idea in equilibrium propagation is that the outputs that are producing predictions are going to be receiving signals when uh, they make mistakes, uh, and those signals will push them, will nudge them towards. Um, uh, better uh, values in the sense of uh, lower value of the prediction error. But because of feedback connections, uh, these, these nudges will propagate to all of the uh, network, again, through the same dynamics, and then um, the network will converge to a slightly different state. So, so we've actually uh, uh, made this story formal and we can prove that if you're able to do uh, these two phases and you know they converge and then you, you look at what's called the sufficient statistics so things like uh, Hebian um, uh, pre times post uh, firing right products uh, and you, you take the, differ the difference of them so something fairly similar to a lot of previously proposed um, learning rules you can actually estimate the true gradient of the um, prediction error. Now, there, is a, um, th there are several issues left with uh, this approach. Um, one of them is we, I mean, for, for a realistic biological implementation, um, would like the um, 
the, the, the computation of the prediction to happen very quickly. Like, you know, if something, you, we, we already know that uh, in about 100 millisecond, uh, your visual cortex can, can you know, um, uh, detect objects. And so um, it is, uh, almost a single feed forward pass uh, is sufficient to do a lot of things. Um, so how do we make sure that the feedback connections um, are not making the convergence to a correct answer uh, not, not too slow, right? So um, because they will interfere, if you want, with the feedforward connection. So, so we have a scheme that we started working on with Walter San and Joao Sacramento in which we use lateral connections to cancel, to, that, that are trained to cancel feedback connections, right? So you have pyramidal cells, you have feedback connections arriving from downstream layers onto the apical dendrites, and uh, now you're gonna have lateral connections that learn to cancel that feedback. So um, when the downstream neurons are uh, behaving in a way that's predictable by the, the, the current uh, layer, the current area, um, the lateral connections can predict the feedback that will come from the downstream layer, and so the, the feedback is canceled. And so the, the, the feedback connections don't interfere with the feed forward, and you have essentially uh, immediate convergence. Um, however, when the downstream neurons are receiving feedback that uh, you know, contradicts what they have been doing, that is not predictable by, by the, this current layer, um, then there will be a mismatch between the, 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 the feedback and the, the, the prediction to cancel that feedback from the lateral connections, and that difference will exactly correspond to the equivalent of the, you know, what backprop wants to compute, so the error um, that the neuron is trying to correct corresponding to the gradient of the whatever prediction error or, or reward uh, with respect to that neuron. So this is, I'm, I'm only sketching uh, the ideas here, and, um, and, and this can be combined with the ideas I, I told you before to make the, the dynamics converge faster. Um, there are also other works that are interesting in which, again, the structure of the pyramidal cell with the apical dendrites on one hand and the basal dendrite on the other hand actually play an important role to decouple the, the, the the, the feed-forward computation, if you want, from the error computation. Um, there are other issues that we're working on. Um, so one, one problem with the theory that we have right now is that it requires the network to have symmetric weights. In other words, it, for a uh, neuron A to B, if there's a, a, a weight in the feed-forward direction, there should be uh, the same weight in the feedback uh, direction, which is not biologically plausible. Um, and so we've, we've developed a version of the theory uh, with weaker conditions that don't require symmetric weights and would still uh, lead to um, convergence. Um, so uh, that's, that's one thing we're, we're working on and, and we have uh, an archive paper on. Um, we're also working uh, with uh, uh, Joel Zilberberg, Blake Richards, and Tim Lerikrap on actual experiments on mice uh, to try to test some of these ideas. And it's gonna take a while before we can test the full uh, generality of, of these uh, theories, but we are starting small. Um, yeah, so, so some of the questions that can potentially be tested. Um, um, so for example, one of the hypotheses that uh, would be, uh, could be tested eventually is that um, simply, there is, is something like gradient descent, that neurons in the middle of a, a big chain of computation will change their synapses so that at the next trial, say, um, their, their behavior corresponds to um, uh, causally uh, leading to a better prediction. Um, so I think it is actually possible to test these hypotheses by collecting statistics about the spiking behavior of, of neurons which are believed to be changing in the context of uh, a surprise uh, where say the animal doesn't, doesn't expect the, 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 what is being observed. Um, another related hypothesis and now it's connected to uh, this notion that the errors are encoded in the temporal derivatives um, 
that if we look not at the next trial, but just like in the, say, tens or hundreds of milliseconds right after a surprise that uh, in a neuron that we know is changing because of the surprise, um, we should see its activity move, its average activity move in the direction of uh, what would correspond to a better prediction, right? So not just, um, so the, the first thing at the next trial is because synapses have changed. Whereas the second thing is because uh, even before synapses change, the activity has changed because of feedback connections that are driving the activity of the neuron towards a better uh, value. So, so these are two different kinds of hypotheses, and the second one really gets closer to these ideas about how air would be encoded in the brain. Um, we could also test these ideas that I mentioned about a role of lateral connections uh, to actually cancel the feedback connections. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you know, experimentally that could be done, but uh, I imagine this would still be something feasible if we can, um, if we can measure uh, what's going on on the, um, um, on the path from the apical dendrite to the soma. Okay, let me now uh, switch to a related problem. Uh, up to now, the kind of implementation of backprop in the brain that I've told you about really has to do with uh, something like uh, static computation, something that happens within like 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. Um, but the way we're using backprop in deep learning allows us to train uh, systems that have dynamics that you know, uh, enroll over uh, much longer durations and, uh, and so these recurrent networks, as we call them, can learn to manage, to, to, to uh, predict or uh, to produce uh, sequences, uh, like for speech recognition or machine translation or whatever. Um, and, and these are trained with backprop as well, but it's a form of backprop we call backprop through time, which, which requires uh, a form of computation that seems totally implausible. Like, I, basically, it requires storing all of the, of the steps of computation of the network over time and then replaying them backwards in detail uh, with, with gradients being propagated. And that sounds completely ludicrous for a brain. Um, so what are the options? Um, it's not clear. Um, yet, uh, you know, humans and animals obviously learn not just, you know, when there's an instantaneous um, feedback or like prediction error, but also over longer durations. So one idea that we're exploring is to use an associative memory in order to, um, to do the job. So, so the idea is this. So let's say that um, you're driving your car and you hear a pop sound and you notice it, but you just continue driving. And then maybe an hour later, uh, you stop and you take some gas and then you see that you have a flat. So, uh, so then you realize that, oh, the pop sound, it, it was probably you know, uh, something that uh, punctured my tire and I should have stopped and changed the tire. Okay, so, so what's happened there is that uh, your, your associative memory is, is uh, recalling an event that happened say an hour ago and bringing back your mental state as it was, or part of it, uh, an hour ago. And, um, and now you're basically uh, able to change synapses so that the, the sort of behavior and interpretation and decisions that you made an hour ago um, uh, would have been different uh, after that uh, change. So, uh, so we, we implemented something like this in, in, in uh, simulated experiments where we use a simple associative memory at the level of the uh, hidden representations of a recurrent net. Um, so the recurrent net uh, in the forward phase just you know, goes over time like this, but at every moment in time when you get some kind of error, it's allowed to recall a few uh, events in the past through the associative memory, which is just matching current state with past states. And, and then for those um, states that are being recalled, you're allowed to do uh, backprop into those states. And, and the way you do that is that the, the associative memory you can think of as like containing uh, a, uh, a prediction of the future given the past. And uh, we can 
it, which is implemented by, by a piece of network, and we can backprop through that piece of network on the spot, and then backprop into how the, that, that, um, that state of the world in, in the past event uh, led to um, actions or uh, interpretations or, or whatever. So, so this, is, this is an interesting path that connects both uh, neuroscience uh, with memory and, and, and cognitive science, of course. Uh, and um, it, it uses a form of attention mechanism that, that's similar to what we've been exploring uh, in the past. So in terms of backprop, uh, just to summarize, uh, it's, it's really the workhorse of uh, amazing successes of deep learning in, in recent years. And um, it'd be interesting to see if brains are using something analogous, not exactly the same thing, but that approximates the computation of gradients in an efficient way. Because uh, if you look at the typical ideas um, that are um, uh, believed by many neuroscientists that uh, you can estimate those gradients by some sort of perturbation method, these do not scale to the, the size of the brain. Just that the amount of noise that comes up from uh, these estimations do, do not scale. So, so we need a mechanism of efficient credit assignment and, um, and, and we need to discover how the brain does that. <clears throat> so I told you about equilibrium propagation, which is an approach in which the same circuit can be used both for making predictions and for estimating gradients, and how using an associative memory could potentially um, uh, avoid this need for backpropagation through time, which, which is absolutely not biologically plausible. Um, so I would just want to mention uh, a last uh, bit of uh, research that we're doing uh, that I call the consciousness prior, so that connects more to cognition, uh, but also to attention. Um, and um, the idea is that <clears throat> um, there are things in the world that can be uh, predicted um, or um, uh, explained using what is currently uh, in your, you know, uh, that you're thinking about in, in your attentive consciousness um, and and, and these, these pieces of information are tiny compared to what is going on in, in you know, the, your whole brain. It's like a, a very, very low dimensional object which can be used to predict what's gonna happen next, for example, uh, uh, involving very few variables. So for example, you know, I hold my glasses, I can uh, drop them and I can you know, mentally predict that I'm gonna be able to catch them and I can make that prediction with uh, almost you know, perfect certainty. And, and that prediction only involves very few variables like my glasses and where my hands are and the fact that I'm standing up. Um, so compared to the full state that my you know, brain is, is uh, registering about the world right now. Um, so this ability to uh, describe um, elements of the world using very few dimensions or very few variables implies something about the representations that the brain is building. That uh, the representation is not like, uh, like pixels, where if I just pick a few pixels and try to predict a, a few of them given a few others, it's not gonna work. But, but with the right abstract representations, I can do it. I, you know, if I represent things in terms of like the positions of these objects and, and other abstract quantities like this, I can uh, make very powerful predictions. So it's, it's uh, I call this a consciousness prior because the idea is that the constraint that we, we have to be able to make these kinds of low dimensional predictions uh, imposes something on the representations that are being learned uh, so that they have this sort of abstract um, uh, nature that we would like to force onto these types of networks. So um, I, I realize that uh, we're um, a bit over time, but I wanted you just to, to get a sense of uh, this, this direction of research.